Hey everyone, I'm Steve from GamersNexus.net and this is episode 11 of Ask GN. We haven't done one of these for about two weeks now because of the crazy game launch season that's been going on. I'm sure you've all seen, of course, Battlefront, Fallout 4, Black Ops 3. There's at least one other one in there. We did some Overwatch work as well. So it's been non-stop for the last few weeks, just benchmarking game after game, hours and hours a day with the help of some of our testers like Mike Gaglione, big shout out to him for helping out. And of course, Keegan doing the videos, all that. So it's been a very crazy couple of weeks here, but we're back with Ask GN. So let's just dive right into it. The first question here is from Obzin33, who says, I need some help overclocking my 6700K. I'm using the ASRock Extreme 6 motherboard with the Corsair H105 cooler. I'm currently at 4.4 gigahertz on auto voltage, but once I go above 4.4, it crashes even with more voltage. Should I mess with load line calibration? So this is a good question as well. One of the things that we do when overclocking CPUs for review purposes is disable all of the power saving stuff. And this is even without overclocking CPUs we do this because it's important to get consistent test data for reviews. As a user, you can kind of leave it on, but when you are overclocking, it is a good idea to disable some of the C states if it's an Intel CPU, which in this case it is, to disable the load line calibration helps with some stuff. It helps with V-droop, which is the dip in voltage. So if you have a, a, a voltage supply, imagine a line, just a line on a graph. Every now and then it'll dip like that. And that's, that's not a good thing because as you approach higher clock rates, you can introduce a lot of instability by any voltage drop like that called V-droop. And load line calibration helps with that. So at higher load line calibration settings, you can sustain a more consistent voltage, but it does risk blasting the CPU with voltage and it can heat it up. And I would generally advise against maxing out load line calibration because as you do max it out, you are potentially threatening the lifespan of your CPU. If you're planning to replace in a year anyway, it's kind of, it's one of those, ah, who cares? But if you are trying to keep this for long-term use, I would not max out load line calibration. If you enable it to some extent, your motherboard should have a recommendation if it's a good board. It'll normally recommend you want 50% if you're overclocking or you want 100% if you're doing an extreme OC or whatever. But generally using load line calibration will assist. As far as disabling it, it is, I probably, I probably wouldn't do that unless you really have nothing else to disable. So go for the C states first. I'm just checking my own notes here because I did take some notes on this question. Uh, you'll want to do a base clock overclock. So if you're stuck at 4.4 with the multipliers, you can get a bit more out of the CPU with a base clock or BCLK increase, and that will allow finer control. So you can do smaller steps basically between the clock rates. And then you also want to do manual voltage control. So get off that auto control and switch over to manual and just do some burn-in tests to see how it performs. If you want to do a real-world burn-in test, games like The Witcher 3 produce a pretty good load for CPUs. Fire Strike is a very good load test that's kind of real-world. You can do the combined test to stress the CPU and the GPU, but or the physics test to just stress the CPU. But that's kind of that's where I'd start with those power states. And you should probably get a bit more than 4.4 gigahertz, but sometimes the silicon is just not as good. So it is possible that your CPU in particular isn't that great at overclocking. Or your motherboard could be limited, but the Extreme 6 isn't bad. You should be able to get a bit more. Next question is from Kaffee O or Coffee O, who says, Have you been <laughs> Have you been following my search history? This was in reply to the overclock special we did last time. Just got an R9 290 reference card and I'm hoping to water cool so I can overclock or flash it to the R9 290X. That is definitely something you can do, which is an interesting thing with AMD cards. Do you know if there are any concerns with overclocking a reference 290 if I can't get a water block soon? First of all, there are concerns with flashing. It, in my experience, has worked out pretty well but you do carry a risk of bricking your BIOS, your firmware on the video card when you flash it. So for anyone interested in that, just know that you carry a risk of potentially damaging or disabling the video card, even if it is uncommon on some devices. And talking to reference cards only have one BIOS normally, so there's not really a, a recourse or a, 
a case of action you can take to resolve that. With the overclocking cards, this is one reason they're really cool. This is one reason that things like the Kingpin just off the top of my head exist. It's because they have multi BIOS. So if you do brick your BIOS, you kind of switch a physical switch and you can enable the second one. And then you try it again, hopefully with something more stable. But getting back to the question here, are there any concerns with overclocking a Reference 290? Yes, the concerns are thermals. So the Reference 290 has a pretty bad cooler design. We actually do have a Reference 290 in-house, or 290X, I should say. And if you look at it, the uh, so this is our video card, right? And this is where the slot is. Over here where the fan is, it uses a blower fan, which is a good thing normally, but it's got the whole intake right here closed off except for one spot. So if you have front intake from your case, it's not going where we'd want it to go, which is straight into the fins. It's got to go instead around the underside of the faceplate and then into the blower fan. So it's not a great design thermally, and that will be a restriction. As long as you monitor your thermals actively, you'll be fine. Just use ADA64 or what's a free tool? Hardware Monitor has a free tool, HW Monitor, and Speed Fan has a free tool. I think that's only CPUs, though. There, there's a couple free tools for monitoring. We use ADA64, which is a professional utility. I think they have a trial version that you can use. I would use one of those. Monitor the GPU diode temperature actively when you overclock. Run your burn and test. Watch it. Fermark. Fermark has a GPU diode reader in it as you run the test. It's not the best test in the world because it's a little more stressful than necessary sometimes, but that is one way to see it. And as long as you're not sort of hitting dangerous temperatures, I, I personally like to stay below 90, and that is still pretty darn hot, but 90 is about where I start feeling uncomfortable, and then you definitely want to be below, you want to be below 90. That's kind of, that's kind of my limit, personally. Uh, some cards will go up to a max of 100 before they shut down thermally, but 90 is a good max, and even sitting there is not great for the silicon in long-term use. But one thing that's cool is with the new Radeon setting the suite, you can do per game overclocking. So if you don't need the overclocking for everyday use, you don't need it for Counter-Strike Go, but you want it for The Witcher, then you can do that. And I would recommend that for purposes of longevity. Moving to a liquid cooler first is a recommendation. So I would wait till you get that water cooler if you haven't already gotten it at this point. Next question, or the last question, Royal Predator says, right now, how smart is it to buy a GTX 980 Ti? So this, is, this goes back to what I was saying at the beginning. The 980 Ti and all the existing cards, especially at the top end, the high end, are still really good even with Pascal coming and whatever AMD's got next. So just because there's a new architecture doesn't mean you should stop your upgrade plans. This is something we've said regularly for the last few years of operation. There's always something around the corner in the hardware world. Once it gets to Pascal, you're gonna be like, should I buy this one or should I wait for whatever the next one that AMD is doing is? And I would just say, if you need a card now, just buy it now, because the next GPUs that will compete with the 980 Ti are quite a ways out. We're looking at 2016 sometime, probably towards the middle or end. So I, I really wouldn't hold back my upgrade plans based on an architecture that doesn't even publicly exist yet. If you have a good card already, you can wait. But if you're buying now, just get something and use it. If you really want to save some money, maybe buy like a 960 or a 970 and then invest more heavily in the next architectures when they come out. But I would not halt my upgrade and build plans for the things after Skylake or Zen or uh, Pascal. So that is all for this episode. If you like this content, as always, hit that Patreon link in the post roll video. Thanks again for watching, supporting the channel. As always, if you like some of the content you're seeing, please share it, that's the best way you can help. And uh, we've got some other cool stuff coming out soon, so stay tuned and I'll see you all next time.